And now I am pleased to introduce the president of the Josiah Macy Jr. Foundation, Dr. Holly Humphrey. Thank you, Peter. And let me add my welcome to all of you joining us today. I would like to begin today by introducing our panelists whose names you see in front of you on um, the slide. We have with us today, Dr. Valerie Montgomery Rice, who is the president and dean of the Morehouse School of Medicine. We also have Dr. Joe Kirshner, who is the dean of the School of Medicine, provost and executive vice president of the Medical College of Wisconsin. Let's turn to an outline of what I hope to cover in today's webinar. I will begin by providing an overview of how the Macy Foundation's webinar series came to be. Then I will turn it over to Dr. Montgomery Rice to provide important historical background on anti-Black racism. Valerie will then hand the presentation off to Dr. Kirchner who will speak on structural barriers leading to persistent anti-racism in our country and in our society that has a huge impact on health and healthcare and our clinical learning environments. Next, our two panelists will present the four major recommendations that emerged from the Macy Foundation's conference on harmful bias and discrimination. Our aim today is to leave a significant portion of time for a question and answer period to engage with all of you participating today. We will then conclude with planned follow-up after today's presentation, and we'll share a preview of what is ahead in future webinars. So let me begin with the discussion of how we came to this point. A year ago, the Macy Foundation sponsored a conference on harmful bias and discrimination. We invited 44 thought leaders representing multiple health professions, um, education leaders, uh, students, residents, et cetera. And um, to prepare for that conference, we had four commissioned papers and three case studies. We came up with a group of consensus recommendations at the end of that conference. And you will hear those recommendations today from our panelists. You can find them at the link that you see in front of you. Next slide. Our conference began by articulating a vision statement. And let me just read it to you. Our nation's health professions learning environments from classrooms to clinical sites to virtual spaces should be diverse equitable and inclusive of everyone in them, no matter who they are. Every person who works, learns, or receives care in these places should feel that they belong there. And for the purposes of today, I would like to underline that Black Americans comprise 13.4% of the United States population. Last year, there were 1,600 Black students who graduated from our allopathic medical schools, only 600 of them were Black men. Black Americans make up 5% of physicians and less than half are Black men. There are now multiple studies in the published literature supporting the fact that a higher concordance on race between the provider and the patient results in consistently better health outcomes. And so with that, let me turn this over to Dr. Montgomery Rice, who will provide the historical background. Next slide. Thank you, Holly. And, and thank you, Joe, for sh doing this with me. Um, we are very excited to share our thoughts. And I thought you all that I would begin with a four to th three to four minute um, video clip that sort of gives a historical overview of um, challenges uh, with racism in this country. You may begin. Why is it that Blacks seem to have such difficulty moving ahead in America? 
Don't other ethnic groups also face discrimination? Don't they also have to deal with poverty and exclusion? This came to mind recently when I watched a short clip of Martin Luther King being asked that very question during a television interview in 1967. He explained that blacks are unique in being the only ethnic group that was brought to America involuntarily in chains. They labored as slaves until finally in 1865 they were freed. But even then, while a massive number of Europeans were coming into the country and receiving land in the Midwest and West, African-American slaves, despite having worked for 250 years in America without ever being paid, received little to help them get on their feet. Martin Luther King also put an emphasis on the psychological damage that was done. To maintain slavery and segregation, there had to be an ideology of white supremacy, one that left lasting effects on both blacks and whites. I would add to this the willful destruction of the black family through much of American history. Because slaves were not treated as human beings but property, the law did not recognize their marriages nor even their rights over their children. Families were routinely and forcibly broken up. After 250 years of slavery came 100 years of state-sponsored discrimination and then civil rights. But soon began what Michelle Alexander has called the new Jim Crow, a system of policing and mass incarceration that has made it so that a black man in America has a one in four chance of being incarcerated in his lifetime. This is according to the sentencing project estimates. Well, emancipation for the Negro was really freedom to hunger. It was freedom uh, to the winds and rains of heaven. It was freedom without food to eat or land to cultivate, and therefore it was freedom and famine at the same time. And when white Americans tell the Negro to lift himself by his own bootstraps, they don't, oh, they don't look over the legacy of slavery and segregation. I believe we ought to do all we can and seek to lift ourselves by our own bootstraps. But uh, it's a cruel jest to say to a bootless man that he ought to lift himself by his own bootstraps. And many Negroes, by the thousands and millions, have been left bootless as a result of all of these years of oppression and as a result of a society that deliberately made his color a stigma and something worthless and degrading. And that is why the situation for blacks in America is different. And hopefully that gives you some context as to why we would entitle this anti-Black racism, taking action on harmful bias and discrimination in the clinical learning environment. Marie Zakaria gave us a great overview of the systemic nature of the problem. This slide is also one that demonstrates the reading of a book that I've recently read by Isabel Wilkerson, Cass, The Origins of Our Discant, Dis Discontent. Cast is defined by granting or withholding respect, status, honor, attention, privileges, resources, benefit of the doubt, and human kindness to someone per their perceived rank or standing in the hierarchy. There's an overlap between racism and casteism. And caste, while a global occurrence, achieved this most violent manifestation in the treatment of American Blacks, maintained through the systems of law and order, as discussed on the previous slide. Next slide, please. When we think about caste, though, we have to recognize that all Americans, both black and white and everyone, are placed in specific roles in society and subliminally blinded and conditioned to not seeing a person's full potential. The importance of this, you all, is that all of us are impacted. And many of the things that impact our decisions and our processes subliminally happen every day and we are conditioned. But what happens with this as a consequence, this ensures inequity and racism are built in every system we have. Healthcare, 
education, housing, and the economy. Next slide, please. And it shows up for us in the foundation of health disparities in the United States. Whether it's medical experiments that we've all heard about on Blacks as early as the 1800s with Sims or, or, or whether it was the Tuskegee syphilis experiment or the Mississippi appendectomies, whether it's refusal of care or substandard care or access to care. And then of course, what we're seeing now is the substantial cost of healthcare delineated by a person's race a socioeconomic status. Next slide, please. This is a paper from a paper that we recently published at Morehouse School of Medicine through our National Center for Primary Care. And I thought it relevant to show here because it looks at a graphical depiction of a portion of people who were enslaved persons in a county in the 1860s. And I ask you to follow through and to see the patterns that have evolved. In the middle, you see the COVID-19 cases. And on the end, you see the COVID-19 deaths per 100,000. And you can begin to see the similarities because this represents a place-based historic measure of structural racism that was positively associated with not just modern day mortality rates, but it also influences the social determinants of health. And we are seeing this same pattern emerge in our current pandemic, structural barriers, structural racism, continued challenges with social determinants of health and continued opportunities to remove health inequities and to get us to health equity. Next slide. Now I will turn this over to Joe, who will talk about how do we address issues at an institutional level. And previously we've looked at the patient bias at institutional levels, but now we wanna talk about how all of this shows up in the learning environment. Joe, I turn it over to you. Joe, you're on mute. I see that. Uh, I said thank you, Valerie, and my thanks to the Macy Foundation for allowing me to participate in this webinar. Um, very much looking forward to dialoguing with all the participants as we get to the question and answer session. But as Valerie said, um, there have been some conversations um, around guidelines for patients and patient conduct, and I won't spend much time on this slide talking about that other than to maybe punctuate or emphasize what Valerie said around around sort of the institutional um, aspects of racism and biases um, that confront us on a daily basis. And, um, you know, I'm certainly old enough to have, have grown up in a time when we sort of said, well, we'll forgive our patients for um, this, that, and the other thing. And, and we, shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't try to stand up to racist behaviors necessarily while they're sick and not well. And I think it's really important um, to know that, uh, again, that's one example of how our healthcare institutions or our healthcare environment has put up obstacles and structural um, biases and, and, and structural obstructions for people of color, people that have been victims of racism uh, to move forward. So um, we could spend actually an hour on that topic in and of itself, but I, but I, won't, I won't stay there. Um, really want to just sort of move forward um, talking about, um, as, as Valerie said, what we should be thinking about as it relates to uh, clinicians and, and organizations. And I think 
One of the most um, important pieces of this for, for our clinicians is to sort of understand where things start as organizations that represent health or represent our medical schools and, and how we have a responsibility to uh, really move in a different way when we're thinking about training our students, our residents, and, and others in our health professions. Um, I think this slide provides some really important basic frameworks um, that we need to consider. But having said that, I, I would just say more broadly, we, we need to think of our organizations as anti-racist organizations and very proud of the fact that the Medical College of Wisconsin publicly has declared that. Um, and we're on a, a journey. Again, it's important to say that it's a journey. It's not, it's not a destination. You don't ever achieve that destination, but you have to be on that journey and you have to, um, you, you have, to have a, a public declaration of that, in my opinion. And for those of you who are joining us today, if, if the leaders of your organization, your medical school, your healthcare system, haven't, haven't taken that public stance as being an anti-racist organization, I'd ask um, why. I'd ask why haven't the leaders um, engaged in that conversation? Where is your organization's leadership as it states to that? Because if we don't have that, if we don't have a coming together on that, um, it, 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 we won't get to um, progress. And um, I think probably many of you have read Dr. Ibram Kennedy's um, book on how to be an anti-racist. And um, he spoke at the um, Association of American Medical Colleges recently, but I've also um, heard him speak in many uh, other entities um, and conferences. And one of the most important things that he says is that um, not being racist or not racist is not the same as being anti-racist. And so I think for our organizations and our clinicians, we need to have anti-racist um, organizations. And here at the Medical College of Wisconsin, we, we, have a, um, we, we have some things that we've implemented. Um, we have a common read program in which we have um, read Dr. Kendi's book um, as, a, as a group and as a community. We have required um, unconscious bias training for all faculty um, learners as well as um, staff. Um, and we have a, a chief diversity and inclusion officer, which is helping us on this journey. So those are just some examples of ways in which organizations can be looking at this, um, at this um, issue. Um, particularly, there's an increased emphasis and importance for those of us who are um, medical schools or health science universities to take up this mantle and to really represent this in the right way. Uh, next slide. So the remainder of my, um, my comments are gonna be sort of based off of this slide. And um, I just wanna you know, highlight that um, uh, Morehouse and, and Dr. Montgomery Rice's um, staff uh, provided this slide. And I've heard Valerie um, speak on this in a number of different ways. And I'm not gonna hit, um, I'm not gonna hit every single point on this. Um, I think the, the data that is on this slide um, sort of speak for itself. But what I'm going to talk about is sort of how we think about our educational system. And so, you know, if you think about um, the way in which our structural racism and biases enter into this pipeline, as it were. So again, you know, this pipeline here is looking at, um, at um, high school at the beginning of the pipeline. I, I would actually push this even further back than high school if we think about um, the, the way in which we educate students um, at the grammar school level, the middle, middle, middle school level, um, black students in particular um, are, not, are not advantaged into opportunities for STEM-based education. There are structural biases and um, organizational biases that limit opportunities for our students of color and in particular um, black students and in particular, um, as we move forward, we'll talk about black men. But um, so early on, we know that the journey to enter a health profession, certainly to enter medical school, is a long journey. And if there are obstacles being placed early on in that journey, you can see in this graphic how the pipeline is being narrowed um, as, we go, as we go forward. One of the things that we've recognized here in Milwaukee is, um, along with our medical school, we strongly supported um, a school within 
our Milwaukee public school system that's called the Milwaukee, Milwaukee Academy of Sciences, which is um, a K through high school um, school that really emphasizes STEM education. It's a, it's a school that's 99% um, black and African-American students. And this school has some secret sauces that I will tell you about if you want to have another conversation, but their graduation rate is fantastic and their ACT scores are fantastic. And it's because they approach these ideas around STEM-based education in a different way. And we actually have had the first graduate of this um, school, which it hasn't been in, in, in existence for a real long time, uh, enter medical school uh, this past year. Um, you know, as I think about sort of the pipeline programs as you get to university, so again, um, as you get from, from sort of grade school and high school, um, we need the building blocks that are there. And I've already given some examples of, of obstacles, but then as we get to university education, um, there are additional biases and you can, see the, you can see the pipeline getting narrower. There are additional biases and structural problems that push um, people of color, but uh, in particular um, blacks and African-Americans and black men away from the profession of medicine, in particular, um, their MD degree. Um, they're, they're, they're not provided with resources. They're not provided with um, other pipeline um, support to get them ready for medical school. There is a very defined process that happens when, when you go along that to ensure that somebody is ready to have an application. And then, you know, we do know that there are other structural and biases that prevent um, individuals who are ready from getting into medical school. So we know, uh, again, sticking with the theme on black men, we know that there are uh, a large cohort of black men who um, are qualified for medical school um, and who don't, and who complete an application, who don't ultimately get admitted to any medical school here in this country. I would offer that those um, are organizational and structural and biases that are on admissions committees that prevent the matriculation of those individuals. And one of the things we're doing here at the Medical College of Wisconsin is we ensure that um, uh, unconscious bias training is a requirement for all that are serving on our admissions committee to hopefully limit um, the difficulties related to that. But it goes on, right? And so you get into, you get into medical school and, um, and, and, and now what are the resources that our medical schools are providing to our, our people of color um, and in particular, our black and African-American students. And I would offer to you that we have some of the best, what I would say, um, best practices here. We allow um, our students to, se to self-determine the speed with which they matriculate through the academic program. They can decelerate on their own. We have tutors, we have resources for them. We've highly invested in mental health resources. But I will tell you that um, if you're a, and this is a, this is a data piece of data that's hard for me to share, but I, but I want to be transparent with you all. Um, we have a rate that's about twice as much for our black and African American students of being on academic probation here at the Medical College of Wisconsin as our students um, who are white. And it isn't because the black students aren't qualified. It isn't because they're not capable. I would offer to you it's because we still have a long distance to go in our organization around our culture and how we support our students to get to where we need to be. And then I'm gonna, I'm gonna finish with two points. One is that um, it, it, it goes on, right, with our faculty. And, and Holly mentioned um, sort of the, the concordance of, of physicians and how that imp impacts quality and care. But um, our faculty, even though we've done better with, with um, diversity within our medical school ranks, our faculty at medical schools that are the teachers of the next generation still remain very much less diverse than we need them to be. And there continues to be a drop off of the diversity um, as we move from medical student to resident to faculty. And then finally, and Valerie touched on many of these and I, I won't belabor the point, but there are societal aspects around all of this as well, which include um, social determinants of health, but economics, she mentioned. So, you know, how are we supporting our students of color as they look at the uh, enormous costs of going to medical school and making it possible for them to uh, achieve at absolutely their best ca capabilities? And with that, I'll end and turn it back over to Valerie.
I was on mute too, Joe, so sorry about that. So thank you. So we want to go into our four recommendations, and Joe and I are going to tag team on this, and then we definitely want to leave time for questions. So the first recommendation we talked about is building an institutional culture of fairness, respect, and as Joe talked about, anti-racism by making diversity, equity, and inclusion top priorities. So I am the president and dean of a historically Black medical school, and one believes with just that name that we would not have challenges with diversity, equity, and inclusion. That's not true. It is true we have a very diverse student body. We have a very diverse uh, uh, faculty and staff. However, we, like everyone else, have inclusion challenges, meaning that we, we, we segregate or we congregate with people who, we, who look like us and who are more comfortable. I see it in our research labs. I see it uh, sometimes when students are gathering for lunch, et cetera. And so Morehouse School of Medicine is very proud that this year we are recruiting our first chief diversity officer and diversity and inclusion officer because we have got to address the inclusion challenges. We believe that cultural competence, cultural humility is a learned and experienced opportunity for all of us. So I'll just jump in on a couple of things and I, I've made a number of my points um, around the institutional priorities and, and how that uh, needs to move forward. But one of the things I, I, I did highlight on is how we have attrition of uh, diversity as we move along the pipeline um, from certainly early on, but, but even from medical school to faculty and just two things to consider. So. One of the things that, that I've um, really tried to drive forward at our medical school is as we look at our, our resident population to make sure that we have a champion for diversity in looking at um, the types of um, individuals that we're bringing into our training programs, because many of those people will ultimately become faculty. And um, I, I'm a pediatric laryngologist. And, and if you don't know, um, ear, nose, and throat surgery is not a very diverse um, field um, just written largely, but, but we have an enormously diverse residency program here. And part of that is um, because we've made an emphasis on it. And we have some faculty in our department who um, are able to um, represent diversity in a very personal way. And because of that emphasis, we have, um, I believe, the most, um, one of the most uh, diverse residency programs in ear, nose, and throat surgery in the country. And that's leading to us having more diversity on the faculty level. And then just one other example, we have a, we have a, um, a celebration um, at graduation every year for um, our diverse medical students. And one of the things I do is I go around to all the medical students and residents, um, they, 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 both those groups come, and I offer them all a job at the Medical College of Wisconsin, even the medical students who are just starting their residency. It, it, it obviously is somewhat symbolic. I don't hand them a contract with, um, with a dollar sign um, on there. But what I want them to know is when I talk to them is that it's never too early to think about um, a career in academic medicine and that the arms of the Medical College of Wisconsin are open to them coming back to enhancing our diversity. And if we don't, if we're not intentional on it and don't start thinking about it early, we won't get there. Right. Next slide. Okay. Recommendation number two, develop, develop assess, assess and improve systems to mitigate harmful biases and to eliminate racism and all other forms of discrimination. Powerful words. We're not saying decrease, we're saying eliminate. So first of all, you have to have a system in place that recognizes that these harmful biases and racism exist. And you have to acknowledge that it exists. And then you have to have a group effort to eliminate 
the racism and all other forms of discrimination. So part of it is really about self-reflection, the organization self-reflection. And Joe and I both believe that that starts at the top. Yeah, I agree 100%. And, and, and I think um, Valerie mentioned earlier, as did I, that I think having someone that is hired into a position that every day they get up and they think about diversity, equity, and inclusion is really important. And they have to have resources, right? It can't just be an office where somebody gets 25% time and, and, and those kinds of things. It actually has to be resources. And, and, and we're adding additional resources to that office um, as we have this reflection that Valerie has talked about because, um, because it, takes, it takes effort and it takes, it takes money. It takes people's mm -hmm. time and thought processes. The last thing around just sort of dollars and cents I would all add is um, we have a very defined process in which we look at pay equity here at MCW. Um, and I, what a lot of faculty have said to me is, um, you know, it, it's all fine and well and diversity, inclusion, and equity is all fine and well, but if you can't show to me that we're paying people um, an equitable, uh, in an equitable way, then um, maybe you don't really believe it. So we, we are very intentional around the way in which we invest in our systems here to be able to demonstrate whether it's based on race or gender or other um, demographic qualities um, that our pay scales here um, do not have um, unconscious or actually overt biases in them that create inequity um, ar around our organization. Next slide. Next one. This is one that really I think is important. Integrate equity into health professions curricula, e explicitly aiming to mitigate the harmful effects of bias, exclusion, discrimination, racism, and all other forms of oppression. And I will tell you all, it is so easy to block out things, but I remember sitting in medical school and we were studying the reproductive system and then we were studying sexually transmitted diseases. And I remember the slides of every perineum that had a sexually transmitted disease being a black or brown perineum. And I don't know that that was a conscious thing, but I know how it impacted me as I moved into women's health, as I moved into being an advocate for women. And I think about the intentionality of what we have to make sure that we do. It's peer review, it's inclusion, it's discussion to make sure that our curricula, our lectures are not biased, is not unconscious is not conscious, it's not present. Very important. Yeah, I, um, that's a powerful example, Valerie. And, and what I would say is if your um, curriculum and evaluation committees haven't looked at this issue with the lens of being anti-racist, they need to, they need to consider mm -hmm. it. And the reason I specifically said curriculum and evaluation mm -hmm. is because you have the curriculum and that's really, really important. But the evaluation side is equally important, and and you know I, I've been transparent about where we're not um, we're not achieving it the way um, I would expect our institution to do. But you have to look at both of these sides of the coin. Next slide. Right. And this last one, um, probably more people than who would care to have heard me talk about this, but I think it's it's this is the crust of it. You got to increase the number of health professional students, trainees, faculty, and institution administrators and leaders from historically marginalized and excluded populations. And Joe talked about in that pipeline where there are leaks. We got to try to plug it, plug up those um, leaks. Some of them will give us some short-term outcomes or successes. But what we really got to look for you all is the long-term strategies and investments and to remove these conscious and conscious bias about who can succeed based on a limited amount of criteria, a number of criteria that we have put forth. We know that you can shift the curve. We know that people can make up ground from what happened with them when K through five or through elementary school or through high school, but we have to make the necessary investments. And most importantly though, 
we have to believe it matters. That if we are really going to live up to our oath as healthcare professionals, we need to be able to provide holistic, culturally competent care to all people, to all people. And Joe, I'll let you come in and then we want to open up for questions. I'm just going to tell a really quick story because I think stories are powerful. So um, again, as a pediatric ear, nose and throat surgeon, I, I take care of kids and I I had a family in my office and um, I, I like to interact with the patients. And, and this little boy was maybe five, six, seven, somewhere in that range. And I was just asking him about his life and what he wants to do. And um, he's, you know, I, I said, well, you know, you ever thought about being a doctor? and um or or doing something in medicine he said he said to me literally this kid said to me and it still gives me goosebumps to, to hear his voice but um he said um blacks can't be doctors i mean that was literally his his sentence and so you know it wasn't that his parents had said this it was it was the structural racism that exists in our society that had told him that and and, you know, so if you have a, a, a little boy at this age that um, has learned this through all of the structural barriers that we've put in place, we've got a long distance to go to tear those walls down so that we, we, we give the, the absolute um, options to all people, regardless of, of, of race or gender or other demographic factors. And, it, and as Valerie said, it does matter. It does matter. All righty. Okay, we will turn it back over to, I think Peter is gonna lead us through the question and answer. Somebody's gonna tell us how that works. Yes, thank you, Valerie, Joe, and Holly. Um, we're now in the Q&A portion of the, of the webinar. Um, I also wanna let our participants know that the chat function is enabled and you may use that to chat with all attendees and panelists and to share information or best practices with everyone who's joined us with this webinar. Um, we have a number of questions that are now coming in and are um, um, to us now. And I'll, I'll start um, with this one uh, to, the, to our presenters. Um, there is some data that mandatory implicit bias training as opposed to voluntary training leads to greater resistance to the message that we're all trying to convey. Can you comment on this? You know, I, I, I will start you all and, 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 and I will try to be brief. I believe that in order for us to really be able to significantly address the challenges that are conscious and unconscious, we must first do have some level of self-awareness. And if it is not mandatory, and continue to be optional, then sometimes people do not believe it's as important. And I believe that is why many of us in these leadership roles where we're at the top, we say it begins at the top and we try to model the behavior that we want others to follow. And the purpose of making it mandatory, you all, is because everybody can learn something about themselves through implicit bias training. Everybody can. And the resistance is a part of the learning. Understanding why you are resistant is a part of how you address your conscious and unconscious bias. Yeah, I don't have much to add to that. I think that's really well said. One of the things that we had in our unconscious bias training was um, we, we had a, um, a train the trainer program. And so one of the things that happened with all of that is people at very different levels of the organization were the leaders. So you might be an administrative assistant and be in a room that has full professors and uh, senior administrative leaders in the organization. So I, I think um, that particular model worked really well for our organization because you, you sort of, um, yes, you had the mandate, as Valerie said, from, um, from top that this was mandatory, but you would be in a room with, with people at very many different points in the organization. And it allowed, I think, a safe enough place for people to examine if you were somebody that was on the resistance standpoint, why is that? And it, and it also allowed people um, to really have a dialogue that I think was helpful. Thank you. This next question is about the interview process uh, for um, 
Medical School. Um, holistic interview processes seem to improve selection for underrepresented minorities across the educational continuum. Um, can you suggest any reference or direction for where one could find best practices in this domain? I mean, I know that the AAMC has several tools uh, in, and they have several toolkits about how to um, actually um, learn how to do holistic uh, um, interviewing and, and missions process and the key ingredients, right, of what you want to make sure you cover. There are some, um, there are some don'ts you know, there are do's and then there's some don'ts in holistic interview and also. And so you definitely want to look at some of the noted, um, uh, documented um, uh, pedagogy uh, opportunities to understand how it will work for your institution. And you need to be, have, make sure that you are adaptable and agile because it is a learning process based on how your admissions committee has done this in the past and then how you give them an opportunity to learn and train prior to it being implemented. Yeah, that's well said. I think there's two things and I know every medical school is a little different, but I'll just give you my experience here at MCW. So we get about seven, 7,500 to 8,000 applications every year for our 250 or so seats. We have three campuses, two regional and one here. So for us, there, I see two processes. One is how do you go from that 8,000 call it applications to the six or 700 that we interview? So that's really important because um, looking at that application in a holistic process where you're not really going to be able to know that much about the, the, the person, you're just looking at their application is really important. But then for me, the most important piece is, is how you're selecting the people that are on the admissions committee and the interviewers and Valerie touched on those things. So what kind of support are you giving them? Um, as I mentioned earlier, are you requiring them to do additional unconscious bias training before they get that privilege and it really is a huge privilege to sit on an admissions committee to help make that decision about who matriculates into your medical school class. And one of the things that we've really done, which I think has helped us, is we've, we've included more and more students on as the deciders for our medical school class. I think almost by definition, um, not completely, but uh, younger people um, have oftentimes um, um, thought about these issues really deeply. They, in many cases, they've traveled further distance. As I've said, our students are more diverse than our faculty. So by having um, a broader population of students on our admissions committee and signaling to them that we trust them to make the decisions about who's gonna join them in their medical school classes, I, I think has ha had, had a benefit for, for our institution anyway. Thank you. Um, the next question, um, looks to beyond the walls of the medical school and to the clinical training sites that the students will go to. And the question is, how do you ensure that your community-based practitioners that provide important clinical training for the students also abide by your same standards? <laughs> you evaluate them, <laughs> you have, make them have this mandatory training. So, uh, <laughs> It's a requirement. In order for them to get that adjunct uh, faculty appointment, it doesn't, it doesn't come with, oh, thank you so much for just deciding that you wanna take our students on board. You have to understand our cultural values at the institution. We believe that comes with training and participating. We expect for you to be engaged with us beyond just the contact with our students. And we evaluate all of our sites. And uh, we really push for those students' evaluations because we are looking for outliers. And then we don't just kick a, a provider up to the curve if, if they don't meet our standard. We work with them. We started a teaching academy that now all of our adjunct faculty have training modules that they go through and so many that they have to do a year in our teaching academy. We, ho we hold them to high standards also. Yeah, I don't have much to add to that. That's well said. Yeah. 
the next question is about creating culture. Um, how do you create a culture of change um, towards anti-racism curriculum and maintain high talent in higher education? You know, I, I can start. What I will say is um, there, there are many different pieces to that. But one is, um, I think, is really important to realize that when we talk about culture, there is a certain culture in the, in the leadership um, offices, the C-suite, if you will. And those people should be all aligned. And, and we've talked about leadership coming from the top on this issue. But what I would say is, you know, you wherever you are along your journey, you have to realize that within any given organization, there's gonna be some heterogeneity of, of where people are on this journey. And so um, you gotta expect, you gotta demand progress, but you also have to understand that people, people will be on different um, parts uh, of that. And so when you think about your culture, there's the cultural values that the leaders will put forward, but the culture of the organization is gonna be made up by um, many, 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 in most cases, thousands of individuals who um, have br bring their own journey and, and their own lens to this. And so what I would say is, um, you know, again, declaring your organization as, a, as on that journey of being an anti-racist organization is really important. For us here at MCW, um, publicly declaring that allowed us to have conversations that we weren't having. And it allowed us to look at our policies and our procedures in a different way that we weren't doing. And so I think that piece is really, is really important, but it also allows you to put forward um, sort of these value statements in a very organized way. And then um, understanding that people are at a different point in their journey, but then demanding a certain level of where uh, folks need to be to be in good standing in your organization. You got to have the courage to do that, right? So um, just saying that somebody's at a different part of their journey is one thing, but, you know, um, condoning or allowing bad behavior, racist behavior, sexist behavior is not okay. And so you have to, again, going back to the C-suite, you have to have, you have to have the policies and procedures in place that allow you to demand progress for people that are on the wrong side of that equation. And sometimes that requires it, 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 it you know, and as Valerie said, it doesn't mean you separate from somebody immediately. I'm a full believer mm -hmm. in giving people chances for process improvement, but sometimes it does require separation from an individual. You have to be willing as a leader to say, you don't espouse the values that we need to have here. And it's a right, it's sorry, not a right. It's a privilege to work at one of these institutions and if you can't demonstrate that you um, have the cultural values that we need to succeed, we can't have you be part of the family. And, and, and I just want to point out something. If you listen to Joe speak, and, 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 and as a white male, you all, I think that this is very important. One of the things you've heard Joe say, where you are on the journey, what point you are in the organization, he didn't say what level you at, right? Because that depend that sort of insinuates that somebody's at a higher level versus a lower level. He talks about points. He talks about the fact that it is a journey. He talks about points of perspective. All of that demonstrates from a leader, from someone who is viewed as being on the hierarchy, right? A white male, that you have a perspective and it matters and it's equal. And we are all coming to this from multiple different perspectives. I think language matters so much when we're talking about diversity and inclusion. And you know, when we think about what's happening right now with COVID-19 and I won't, don't deviate too much from this, but people keep talking about all the vaccine hesitancy, which is real, but people also are talking about it. Well, how are you going to get people who never trusted the system to take a vaccine? Well, first of all, it's going to begin with acknowledging their concerns, not belittling those concerns, and then building trust. And that's how you get on this journey of creating a culture of competence and the cultural values that reflect your organization. 
I want to add just one thing to um, the very powerful statements that both Joe and Valerie have made here. And that is, if you really want to test whether your mission, vision, and values are working in the culture that you're aiming to create, I would suggest that you regularly check in and ask the most vulnerable people in your organization. So regularly ask your patients, your staff, your students. And if you ask with humility and open ears, I have spent a career learning immensely mm -hmm. from the people who are often the most vulnerable uh, within our organizations. Yeah. Thank you. Um, this next question gets at um, measurement. Um, as you're on this journey institutionally, how do you measure sort of how you're doing? And when do you know when you've actually gotten to that place you want to be? Ooh, that's a, that's a good one. I think Holly <laughs> sort of led into that, right? Yeah. Um, first of all, I think you have to define where you're really trying to get to. What is that destination? And, and you all, you got to put it in your strategic plan. For us, the cross cutting was, I want this to be the best place to work. Well, first of all, you got to ask some questions of people if you really want this to be the best place to work. And they're not going to, you're not going to always like the answers. So you got to have it, first of all, strategically identified somewhere or what you're trying to accomplish. And then you have to set targets with milestones and you have to measure it. And you measure it, you all, to begin with. You got to ask the questions, particularly when it comes to diversity and inclusion. For us, you know, and, and, and I'm not talking about quotas. I'm talking about evidence-based things that say, imagine if you're the only black student in a class of 140 and you're now in a small group setting or a large class setting, you're talking about the George Floyd issue. How does that one black male or black student feel? Particularly when everybody is looking at that person and asking them the question and they're thinking to themselves, okay, okay, I don't speak for the entire black community. I'm feeling vulnerable just like you are. And so that would just say, well, we need more than one. You may not say, okay, I need 25, but maybe I need more than one. And so you have to set some targets or what do you think really makes what I call a posse of people that give you comfort that you can voice and share who you are without feeling that the spotlight is shining on you? So I think this is, this is similar to other strategic planning that you do, right? So, and Valerie said it, you got to have goals. You have to know what the tactics are to reach those goals. And you have to have metrics because you won't achieve what you don't measure. You sure and, so, and so for us, we, we, we are doing that um, across multiple, multiple different venues. And um, I'll just give you an example of where I think we, you know, I've mentioned a couple of times already that, that our faculty isn't as diverse um, as it needs to be. And, and our, um, and our, um, our faculty leaders aren't as diverse as they need to be. And our committees um, that make the rules and regulations that, by which we all live aren't as diverse as they need to be. And so I've set goals in each of those areas, tactics to how to get to those goals, and then metrics along each of those ways um, that, we, that we come upon. And so just one little example is I've said that um, for every faculty member that's hired here at the Medical College of Wisconsin, we have to have a, a search committee. Now that doesn't mean you have to have 20 people in a room and you know, spend um, a million hours talking about it. But one of the things we know is that if you have a less diverse organization and you just leave it up to the one person to decide, well, they're more likely to hire somebody if, you know, if they haven't thought about it much, they're more likely to hire, let's call it a, a white male. That's, that's what, you know, walks in the hallways yeah. of my institution more often than not, right? So by, have, by having a requirement um, that you put more people to have that thought processes, 
it breaks the cycle of, of somebody just sort of living in their own echo chamber of, of what looks like the best kind of person to hire. That's just one example, and there's many more. And I'm just gonna add this comment. The book that I show, Cast, this is not all on black people, it's not all on white people. It is really part of you all, how we have been placed in this society and the roles that we've been asked to play. And it takes a lot of self-awareness. It takes a lot of change for us to move the needle on this. And when you read Cass, what you will see is how subliminally the messaging has been, not just to white people, but to also black people, also to Indian folks, people of Asian descent, also to women, also to men. And we are the only ones, we all of us are the only ones who can change the messaging. We're the ones who can do that, to give everyone a shot at actually being their best self and determining what that looks like. Thank you. We have many more questions than we will be able to get to today. Um, which is a great problem to have, but we are approaching the top of the hour and I'm gonna ask Holly if she would begin to wrap up with some summary concluding remarks. Yes, uh, thank you, Peter. And um, thank you to both of uh, the panelists who joined us today, um, Joe Kirshner and uh, Valerie Montgomery Rice. I, I know that we did not uh, begin to be able to address the many, many questions that have come in through uh, the question and answer um, function on uh, today's webinar. What I would like to um, preview for you, however, is um, this is not the end of the conversation. Um, we at the Macy Foundation have recognized actually over decades that um, working in areas related to diversity, inclusion for the purpose of equity takes a long commitment. It takes a deep commitment to sticking with um, this kind of work to affect real change. And so consider today's webinar as the beginning of a conversation that we will continue in future webinars um, uh, we have future webinars that are currently being planned on anti-Asian racism, another uh, follow-up to this one on anti-Black racism, um, one on people with disabilities, um, which actually was an important part of the conference that we held a year ago um, in February. And then another follow-up uh, conversation on nursing in the clinical learning environment. As I said, um, there were many more questions than we were able to get to in today's webinar. Um, you will see the recording of today's webinar posted on our website um, next week, but you will also, in addition to future webinars, have a chance to hear from us um, through podcasts and through our blogs. Um, so that some of the questions um, may be answered in any one of those other formats so that we can continue this work together, um, not only as our respective health professions, training future health professionals, but to really create the society that will improve health and health care for all Americans. So thank you all um, for joining us today. And again, a very big thanks to our panelists, um, Joe Kersner and Valerie Montgomery Rice. This concludes the webinar on anti-Black racism, taking action on harmful bias and discrimination. Thank you for participating. Have a good day and be safe and healthy. <laughs>